What, uh, <clears throat> I think, I, the date again that you said that you believed that you, you, you were firm in the knowledge that you were a permanent member of the Moody Blues was, was when? Between the end of April 1980 and uh, the beginning of May of 1980. And how, give me all the facts and circumstances that led you to that conclusion. Well, it, was, it, it had become uh, very clear that we were forming a, a great team together as a band. We had uh, the same kind of ideas. We, we were gelling together. We had done already two very successful tours of the United States. And um, we were really on the verge of making a, a brilliant album. We we never we never knew it was going to be number one, subsequently. But it was a very very strong contribution from everybody. Everybody was really uh, pulling together. And um, I was having discussions, constant discussion, about the fact that I was now having been made a member of the inner sanctum. Uh, I was. However, the fifth in the pecking order, according to Graham, and I was on the verge of being a full, fully fledged member of the Moody Blues by the time we would reach the next album or the, the subsequent uh, next album. I, was, I didn't care about the incentive because the difference between 16% and 21% for me doesn't make any difference. I'm not that, uh, that uh, you know. Uh, uh, Let, let's focus on the words inner sanctum, who used them and when? Well, mainly, mainly uh, it was used by Graham Edge, Ray Thomas, Justin and John on a, on a much more limited basis, but uh, mainly Graham and Ray, and uh, I understood what inner sanctum means. Which is? Meant, uh, well, it means part of the inner core yeah. It means sanctum in Latin means saint. So part of the inner saint, the soul of the body. The body was the Moody Blues, the, the, the five of us, at the, you know, and we were forming a unit, we were forming a soul, and we were the part of this inner soul. And how many times did you hear the words uttered inner sanctum by any of the four Moody's? Hundreds of them. Now, who utilized the words pecking order? Mainly Graham. And when was the first time that you heard Graham utilize those words? Oh, in 1978 already. What did he say? Well, he expressed the, um, the notion <coughs> of the development of the band with me as a more permanent member. I would always be the fifth in the pecking order, you know, whatever, whatever happened, I would always be the fifth one uh, from that point on, you know. You know, Mark Jameson, it, it seems like he says he had an oral agreement, and yet what he seems to be trying to prove here is not that on a specific day a conversation took place saying, you remember the band, but that he was part of, he was in the inner sanctum there, that somehow he should have been a part of the band, and maybe the jury should just tell them that. It, it sounds that way. I think that the difference is, as we were talking about, between an understanding and an agreement. And I think in order to establish an agreement, you have to establish that I'm going to do something, and you're going to do something, and you're going to benefit, and I'm going to benefit. And we discussed it, and we agreed that that was going to happen. Well, what does he need, though? I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like, hey, Pat, you're a real trooper. You're a member of the group now. Is that enough? Absolutely not. He Why has not? To, he has to have, he has to, they have to say to him, you know, we want you to stay on. We really think you're very integral to what we're doing. And in order to, without using these words, of course, but in order to induce you to stay on and work with us, continue, we're going to make you part of the band. We're going to give you 16 to 20 percent of the band, whatever the number is. But they have to say what they're going to do, and they have to say what he's expected to do. And then both sides have to do it. Does well, it have to have specific numbers, like 15 percent? Can it just say, we're going to treat you fair, you're just going to be treated like all the rest of us? No. That's an agreement to agree. If, without a number, there's no understanding. It has to be very, very specific. This happens all the time in the music business. Guys get together, and two guys form a band, and they, and they then want to include them in, but they can't because they don't reach an agreement. Okay. So 
If you're thinking of forming a band, that's the advice. Thank you, Mark Chavison, for being uh, here with us. Hope you come back again another time. We'll see if we can have another good trial like this one. Uh, we're going to continue our coverage of Mraz versus the Moody Blues tomorrow night. And for the rest of this week, the jury's decision in this case will be presented on Friday night. Tomorrow night, we'll continue showing you the testimony of the plaintiff under direct examination. Patrick Mraz will describe what his life has been like since he was fired from the Moody Blues. I've, I've, been, uh, I've been broken. Now, in the morning, we'll start a new trial. This one is also a case of... Well, we've been... ...highlights of the trial of the keyboard player who's suing his former band, the Moody Blues, for damages. We'll hear testimony from the plaintiff, Patrick Mraz, on Wednesday evening. Thanks for watching this edition of In Court Today. For court I never know what's happening with them. You know, like John is, is like in, in, in the, the south of uh, Portugal playing golf and Justin's moaning about him and so on. But I don't know, this time I said, I think they don't want to tour with you anymore. Meeting with uh, Mr. Hewlett? I had a meeting with Mr. Hewlett on the 24th of March. Where? Uh, at the Riviera Country Club uh, on, in Pacific Palisades. And where at the country club? In. Uh, the locker room. I so he was changing clothes. Well, I don't know if he was changing. He didn't change in front of me. <laughs> but he was in the locker room. You know, very nice actually. You know. And what did he? What did he tell you? Well, he told me, Patrick, I don't know how to tell you that. That's that's his opening line. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I don't know. You know, these guys. I, I never know what's happening with them. You know, like John is is like in the, in, in the, in the, the south of uh, Portugal playing golf, and Justin's moaning about him and so on. But I don't know. This time I tell you that I think they don't want to tour with you anymore, and uh, they want you uh, out of the band. And uh, what did you say? I was flabbergasted. You know, I was shocked, and I knew it was going to happen because Bob Sola had warned me. And we had eventually um, agreed on some uh, possible um, transition on the 24th of March. Where? Uh, at the Riviera Country Club uh, on, in Pacific Palisades. And where at the country club? In uh, the locker room. I think so the he was changing clothes? Well, I don't know if he was changing. He didn't change in front of me. <laughs> But he was in the locker room, you know, very nice actually, you know. And what did he, what did he tell you? Well, he told me, Patrick, I don't know how to tell you that. But that's his opening line. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I don't know. You know, these guys, I, I never know what's happening with them. You know, like John is, is like in, 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 in the, the south of uh, Portugal playing golf and Justin's moaning about him and so on. But I don't know. This time I tell you that I think they don't want to tour with you anymore. And uh, they want you uh, out of the band. So what did you say? Stay with us. Continued. Stay with us.
following January for her to put together this pathetic one-page document that says, here's a recapitulation. We went all the way back to 1983, and we're, it's all coming. It's all going to be charged against you. When there had never been timely and regular accountings to Mr. Mraz before, and certainly not the previous three years, in terms of the tale that should have been provided to him so that he knew where he was at. He was treated in, as a, he was treated as basically one accounting unit, a continuum, continuing relationship. I have no idea what our obligations are to Patrick Mraz in terms of paying him or paying attention to it. I don't want to be bothered. success. But that year, his career began to skyrocket because he was asked to join the British rock group, the Moody Blues. He proceeded then to play with that band for nearly 13 years on all of their tours and also on their record albums that they cut during that period of time until 1991, at which time the other members of the band told him that they no longer required his services. Well, recently, there was a reunion of sorts of the Moody Blues, but it took place not in an auditorium in front of thousands of screaming fans, not in a music studio cutting an album, but rather in a courtroom in Los Angeles, because Patrick Mraz was suing the Moody Blues, contending, among other things, that they had breached an agreement that he had with them that would have made him a permanent member of that band. For more on this case, here's a background report by Court TV's Steve Johnson. It took place during the month of December, as we said, in Los Angeles. Court TV began its coverage this past Monday. We're going to be going back into that courtroom in just a few moments. In the meantime, Thomas Seltz is our guest commentator this afternoon, an expert in entertainment law, an author, a professor. Uh, let me ask you a question that probably is the first question that pops in the minds of jurors in cases like this. Uh, we know that Patrick Mraz is claiming that he had a contract with the Moody Blues, but he says it wasn't a written contract. It was an oral contract, an oral agreement. And many people's first reaction might be, well, wait a minute, you, there's no such thing as an oral contract. Is there? Well, I think it was Sam Goldwyn who said that a, an oral contract isn't worth the paper it's written on. And uh, I think that certainly is a, a common perception, that you have a contract, it has to be in writing. Uh, there have, however, developed over a number of years a variety of alternative ways of finding that there is a contract, that there is something which is legally enforceable. Um, from a technical point of view, a contract is a meeting of the minds of two people. Two people have agreed between themselves as to what their intention is with respect to a particular item. In this case, it would be uh, a, a meeting of the minds as to what Patrick Moraz's role is in the group Moody Blues. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the easiest way to show what that meeting of the minds is is if the parties have written it down and signed it so that there's a common understanding as to what the terms are. There are in law, however, a number of other ways in which a judge or a jury could find that the parties have reached a meeting of the minds. Uh, one way is, let's say I said to you, I'll pay you $100 if you'll walk across 3rd Avenue against the light. Mm -hmm. And you went ahead and walked across dodging cars and got to the other side safely and mm -hmm. said, okay, give me my $100. Which we do regularly out here. Absolutely. <laughs> to get rush hour. Mm -hmm. And a uh, court would say, if it went to court, that yes, I had made you an offer which required performance, in this case walking across 3rd Avenue against the light at rush hour. You would manage to do it and survive, and therefore there is a meeting of the minds. Right. So that this, obviously, here then we have to see if Patrick Moraes can convince these jurors that absent something in writing, there was a meeting of the minds. Exactly. All right. Well, I want to take you back into the courtroom then. As we said, we began our coverage this past Monday. On the witness stand now is Patrick Moraes, the plaintiff in this case. We had began showing you his testimony yesterday. Earlier on in the plaintiff's case, Plaintiff's attorney Neville Johnson had called a variety of witnesses, including the other members of the band, who basically said in response to his questions that they were just were not involved in the day-to-day -day business affairs, the decisions as to who was going to play what role and the amount of money paid. Now on the witness stand, Patrick Moraz, yesterday he talked about his own background, how he became associated with the band, the Moody Blues. As we pick up now, he's talking about his estimation of his value to the band, what it was that he brought to them. Let's go back into this courtroom in L.A. now and watch. Did you ever try and uh, suggest songs for the Moody's? Try, try and bring your own material in? Uh, well, during Long Distance Voyager? All the time. Yeah, well... well let's go through album by album, Long Distance Voyager. Did you try? Long Distance Voyager, I had my plate full, you know. I was discovering also new keyboards, new technologies, a new way of, of interacting with a new style of writing, songs, a new band, 
new personalities, polishing my English, you know, uh, getting the sense of humor in, in, in English is not really that easy. They, they have a very good sense of humor, very, very dry sometimes, very um, amicable, extremely sophisticated at, at times. Oh. So, lot of work. You didn't try and contribute songs on the I contributed to a lot of music, I did a lot of arrangements and so on, but I didn't ask for any credit per se. Then, of course, I realized after the release of Long Distance Voyager that, uh, you know, there was uh, possibilities of interacting more songs, and I, I've always been for associations. I'm not a lyric man, and I always need lyrics. They, they read great poems, great poetry, and I said I've got, uh, for, for when we, we recorded the present, uh, during the, the breaks, the various breaks at various times, um, I actually composed 55 pieces of music and songs and I also selected, I personally pre-selected 11 songs which could be uh, interacted in association with them for the album. I, I was not saying I want to record 11 songs, but he asked 11 songs, you know. And I went into the studio after the summer break to present these songs uh, during the, the normal session with the producer and the band. And uh, when it was mentioned, I mentioned that I had these songs, nobody actually cared to even listen to those songs at that session. To the part, I was like, okay, fine, fine. Took my tape back, didn't say anything, we, we went and moved on, okay? okay? Were there any other occasions when you tried to present material? I presented a song to Justin A. Wood called, um, about three weeks later, I went to his house uh, after I've made an appointment with him on Saturday afternoon and I presented him a song called uh, You Are the Vision of My Dream, which I wrote entirely, music and lyrics. And um, that was not um, subsequently accepted. He liked the song, but uh, there was no possibility to record it for some reason. Why not? Because we didn't agree on the deal that uh, he proposed. Which was? Well, he wanted the majority, if that song would be recorded by the Moody's and sang by him, he wanted the majority of the publishing and the writing share. How much of a majority? Well, it, 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 it was in the region of 90%. And I, thought, I, I told him, let me think about it. Because, you know, I mean, it was a good song. I wanted to record it myself. So he wanted yeah. the writing credit and 90% of the royalties? Yeah. And you said, I don't want to do that deal? I didn't say I didn't want to do that. I said, let me think about it, I'll come back to you. And eventually, during the course of further recordings for the present, I didn't accept. And I told him that. Do you remember that? Yeah. I do. Please. He said no. Mr. Mr. Morales, Mr. Hayward. I'm sorry. There'll be no, <coughs> I'm sorry. No, no exchange, please. Thank you. Were there any other occasions when you tried to present uh, music to uh, the group? Uh, yes, there was um, some various attempts by myself and, uh, you know, during the recording of um, during the sessions and, and the, the several weeks of recording for The Other Side of Life and um, Sur la Mer. Again. Sur la Mer. S-U-R. L A M E R. And each time, what happened? We're seeing members of the Moody Blues watching the test. The one closest to us is Justin Hayward. Indeed, he was the person who just a few moments ago, Paul Moraz directed his comment to. Judge Paul Boland indicated that their discussions should not be amongst each other. They should simply respond to questions and, by the um, attorneys. That was it. And on Sir Le Maire, you tried to present something, and what happened? Yes, the same thing. I, I played, however, what happened? I just <coughs> played some of the material to Tony Visconti several times, and Tony uh, never actually uh, found any values in my in in the songs, you know. I wrote so for the band, you know. He said it, it, it's not um, proper for the style of the Moody Blues at this stage, you know. So. He's the producer, calls the shots. <coughs> well, turning now to the issue of 
contributions on a musical level. Mm -hmm. How did the band work on uh, LDV and the present? In other words, who played what instruments and how did you interact? We're going to take a break now for just a few moments. When we come back, we'll be picking up with this testimony as the plaintiff, Patrick Mraz, is describing to this jury his role with the band, the Moody Blues. We'll be back in just a few moments, so stay with us. Back to Court TV, we're going to take you now back into this courtroom in Los Angeles where Patrick Mraz is on the witness stand. Once again, he is the former men member of the Moody Blues rock band who is now suing those other band members in the band, claiming that they had terminated him from the group improperly back in 1991. He claims that they owe him money for the tours and the work that they've done since that time. Let's go back in the courtroom and continue with his testimony. I want to know, I mean, were you, who, who, Graham played the drums, Justin played, Justin Hayward played good guitars, John Lodge played bass. Basically, <coughs> Graham played drums, and we all helped him because we wanted the album to be as magnificent as it, as it became. Uh, I don't play guitar, so I never touched a guitar. <laughs> um, Justin wanted to play some keyboards, I understand that uh, we might have had a difference of opinion about that, but overall, you know, I've never had any problems of insecurity about anybody touching my keyboards or whatever. I might have been in a bad mood that day, but so maybe Justin understood that I didn't want him to touch my keyboards, but there's no problem. He plays piano, he plays all the instruments. Justin plays guitars, drums bass, keyboards, and everybody is always welcome to play my keyboards whenever they want, you know, if it's, uh, if it's uh, in, uh, done in an appropriate way. And Mr. Hayward uh, is a good musician. Very good. And how do you rate the other uh, members of the group? Are they good? Yeah, of course. There has been some... Uh, testimony that you uh, may have played out of tune on live? Is, is, is there any truth to that? There might be some truth into that, yeah. I mean, what, what else is new? Rock and roll music, give me I one... Can answer the question call for yes or no? I think you answered the question. Uh, how many times have you ever played out of tune in your life? With the Moody's? Out of how many times? Out of, uh, with the Moody's. How many times have you played with the Moody's on stage? Several hundred times, a bit more. Uh, in percentage basis, maybe 0.01%. Uh, so that means like just about never. Oh, just about uh, just a couple of uh, a, a, a few gigs per tour. I mean. And but but on a very very limited basis because I've got a very uh, good hearing and uh, good tuning and good sense of intonation. Mr. Hayward claims that this clavic clavichord, what's it called, the, the instrument that you hang around? The clavitar. Your, clavitar, that you were out of tune when you played that. Is, there, is that true? It might have been occurring with the early version of the clavitar, which didn't have what I developed at the later stage for the Ro Rolling Corporation, a spring in the wheel. But uh, from 1984, 83, 84 onwards, I was still using maybe the, the old clavitar that had been done, and it was only on, on, on one of Ray's tune called uh, Veteran Cosmic Rocker that it might have happened. However, with the modern days of uh, media and technology and the spring developed in the neck of the, the new controllers, it, it's absolutely impossible to be out of tune with this kind of instrument. And I can prove it here. I think you've answered the question, sir. Were uh, Ray, Thomas, uh, Justin Hayward, or John Lodge ever out of tune? Were they always absolutely letter perfect? Of course not. They were, they were as much out of tune as I was in, in any kind of uh, situation. And uh, the harmonies weren't always absolutely spot on at all times? 
Absolutely not. And it happens with everybody. Were you ever told by them you're out of tune or you're not playing right? Well, we had a smile uh, with each other on, on stage, like, oh, this is a blue one or this is a brown one. <coughs> or, you know, like there, there was uh, degrees of uh, out of tuneness in certain situations, you know. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, some, sometimes it goes in the monitors, it might not even be heard by the audience. And we, we always strive to make a 100% performance, man, you know. No, but did anybody ever tell you, No. hey, you're not a competent musician? Well, I mean, maybe one, one time, Ray, uh, I think it was in Pittsburgh, uh, during the 1981 LBV tour, uh, told me blatantly during the concert that I was, my Mellotron or whatever, was totally out of it. I mean, I was like, I was, I was shocked, and uh, we had a difference uh, of opinion, which um, eventually turned into what we would call a, a mini altercation, you know, backstage, but I mean, that was it. And were you out of tune in Pittsburgh in 1981? I might have been, but you, you might have been drunk as well. Uh, Ray Thomas testified that he, his uh, flute is tuned to uh, C, was it C flat or C sharp? Yes, I've heard that. And uh, is, that, is, that is, there a, is that possible? Well, everything is possible. But if he's tuning his, his flute to C-sharp, then he's not in concert pitch with the rest of the band. Because the band, because concert pitch is what? Well, it depends. Um, concert pitch is normally for an orchestra, A, the note A, which um, frequencies at four, 440 frequencies. However, some instruments and some parts of the orchestra can be tuned up to 444 frequencies. Um, concert pitch is always considered within the range of six commas, between commas. And uh, for example, the difference between a G flat and an F sharp on a violin is one comma. Whether it's concert pitch or not, it's one comma. Ladies and gentlemen, can we go back into the jury room for just a moment? <clears throat> Judge Paul Boland has just asked the jury to step out of the courtroom for a moment during the course of the testimony of Patrick Moraz. Let's go back into the courtroom now and listen to the court's concern. Record like the jury has, has gone. Uh, Mr. Moraz, uh, uh, a while ago I, I indicated to counsel that it was critically important that you be responsive in your questions. And uh, uh, I, I'm about at the point where I think we may have to impose some time limitations on the length of your, your examination. And that may mean that uh, your story will not come out. Uh, you are giving very detailed answers which are which are not responsive to, to the questions and uh, you're giving the jury more information than they can possibly oh, absorb I'm sorry. and and when you look at the jurors they're not listening uh -huh. and uh, and uh, and I'm going to direct that you listen to the question Sometimes the questions only call for a fairly short response, and uh, they do not call for the extraordinarily extensive answers that you are that you're giving. Okay. I will uh, do my best then to uh, All right. amend. All right. Okay. I, I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I mean it's. No, I, I, I testify for a professional. No, no, I, 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 underst I understand that Mr. Moraz is, is anxious to tell his story, and <coughs> you know, that um, and he feels that everything that, he's, that he has said uh, is critical of that story. I understand that, sir. And I've never been in the This happens all the time in the music business. Guys get together, and two guys form a band, and they, and they then want to include them in, but they can't because they don't reach an agreement. 
Okay, so if you're thinking of forming a band, that's the advice. Thank you, Mark Chavison, for being uh, here with us. Hope you come back again another time. We'll see if we can have another good trial like this one. Uh, we're going to continue our coverage of Mraz versus the Moody Blues tomorrow night. And for the rest of this week, the jury's decision in this case will be presented on Friday night. Tomorrow night, we'll continue showing you the testimony of the plaintiff under direct examination. Patrick Mraz will describe what his life has been like since he was fired from the Moody Blues. Oh, yes, I've, I've been... Uh... I've been broken. Now, in the morning, we'll start a new trial. This one is also a case of... Well, we've been... ...highlights of the trial of the keyboard player who's suing his former band, the Moody Blues, for damages. We'll hear testimony from the plaintiff, Patrick Moraz, on Wednesday evening. Thanks for watching this edition of In Court Today. For court I never know what's happening with them. You know, like John is, is like in, 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 in the, the south of uh, Portugal playing golf and Justin's moaning about him and so on. But I don't know, this time I tell you that, I think they don't want to tour with you anymore. With uh, Mr. Hewlett? I had a meeting with Mr. Hewlett on the 24th of March. Where? Uh, at the Riviera Country Club uh, on, in Pacific Palisades. And where at the country club? In. Uh, the locker room or something. So he was changing clothes? Well, I don't know if he was changing. He didn't change in front of me. <laughs> but he was in the locker room, you know. Very nice, actually, you know. And what did he What did he tell you? Well, he told me, Patrick, I don't know how to tell you that. That's, that's his opening line. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I don't know. You know, these guys, are, I never know what's happening with them. You know, like John is, is like in, 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 in the, the south of uh, Portugal playing golf and Justin's moaning about him and so on. But I don't know. This time I tell you that I think they don't want to tour with you anymore. And uh, they want you uh, out of the band. And what did you say? I was flabbergasted, man. You know, I was shocked. And I knew it was going to happen because Bob Seller had warned me. And we had eventually um, agreed on some uh, possible um, transition scheme at the 24th of March. Where? Uh, at the Riviera Country Club uh, on, in Pacific Palisades. So where at the country club? In uh, the locker room. I think. So he was changing clothes? Well, I don't know if he was changing. He didn't change in front of me. <laughs> But he was in the locker room, you know, very nice actually, you know. And what did he, what did he tell you? Well, he told me, Patrick, I don't know how to tell you that. That's, that's his opening line. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I don't know. You know, these guys, are, I never know what's happening with them. You know, like John is, is like in, 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 in the, the south of uh, Portugal playing golf and Justin's moaning about him and so on. But I don't know. This time I tell you that I think they don't want to tour with you anymore. And uh, they want you uh, out of the band. And so what did you say? Continued. Stay with us. So, part of the inner saint, the soul of the body. The body was the Moody Blues, the, the, the five of us at the you know, and we were forming a unit, we were forming a soul, and we were the part of this inner soul. And how many times did you hear the words uttered inner sanctum by any of the four Moody's? Hundreds of times. Now, who utilized the words pecking order? Mainly Graham. 
And when was the first time that you heard Graham utilize those words? Oh, in 1978 already. What did he say? Well, he expressed the, um, the notion <coughs> of the development of the band with me as a more permanent member, I would always be the fifth in the pecking order, you know, whatever, whatever happened, I would always be the fifth one from that point on, you know. You know, Mark Jameson, it, it seems like he says he had an oral agreement, and yet what he seems to be trying to prove here is not that on a specific day a conversation took place saying, you remember the band, but that he was part of, he was in the inner sanctum there, that somehow he should have been a part of the band, and maybe the jury should just tell them that. It, it sounds that way. I think that the difference is, as we were talking about, between an understanding and an agreement. And I think in order to establish an agreement, you have to establish that I'm going to do something, and you're going to do something, and you're going to benefit, and I'm going to benefit. And we discussed it, and we agreed that that was going to happen. Well, what does he need, though? I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like, hey, Pat, you're a real trooper. You're a member of the group now. Is that enough? Absolutely not. He, has, not? To, he has to have, he has to, they have to say to him, you know, we want you to stay on. We really think you're very integral to what we're doing. And in order to, without using these words, of course, but in order to induce you to stay on and work with us, continue, we're going to make you part of the band. We're going to give you 16 to 20 percent of the band, whatever the number is. But they have to say what they're going to do, and they have to say what he's expected to do. And then both sides have to do it. Does well, it have to have specific numbers, like 15 percent? Can it just say, we're going to treat you fair, you're just going to be treated like all the rest of us? No. That's an agreement to agree. If, without a number, there's no understanding. It has to be very, very specific. What, uh, I think, I, the date again that you said that you believed that you, you, you were firm in the knowledge that you were a permanent member of the Moody Blues was, was when? Between the end of April 1980 and uh, the beginning of May of 1980. And how, give me all the facts and circumstances that led you to that conclusion. Well, it, was, it, it had become uh, very clear that we were forming a, a great team together as a band. We had uh, the same kind of ideas. We, we were gelling together. We had done already two very successful tours of the United States. And um, we were really on the verge of making a, a brilliant album. We'd, we'd never, we never knew it was going to be number one subsequently. But it was a very, very strong contribution from everybody. Everybody was really uh, putting together. And um, I was having discussions, constant discussion, about the fact that I was now having been made a member of the Inner Sanctum. Uh, I was however the fifth in the pecking order according to Graham and I was on the verge of being a full fully fledged member of the Moody Blues by the time we would reach the next album or the, the subsequent uh, next album I was I didn't care about the incentive because the difference between 16 percent and 21 percent for me doesn't make any difference I'm not that uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, let's focus on the words inner sanctum, who used them and when? Well, mainly, mainly uh, it was used by Graham Edge, Ray Thomas, Justin and John on a, on a much more limited basis, but uh, mainly Graham and Ray, and uh, I understood what inner sanctum means. Which is? Meant, uh, well, it means part of the inner core it means sanctum in Latin means saint.
following January for her to put together this pathetic one-page document that says, here's a recapitulation. We went all the way back to 1983, and we're, it's all coming. It's all going to be charged against you. When there had never been timely and regular accountings to Mr. Mraz before, and certainly not the previous three years, in terms of the tale that should have been provided to him so that he knew where he was at. He was treated in, as a, he was treated as basically one accounting unit, a continuum, continuing relationship. I have no idea what our obligations are to Patrick Mraz in terms of paying him or paying attention to it. I don't want to be bothered. success. But that year, his career began to skyrocket because he was asked to join the British rock group, the Moody Blues. He proceeded then to play with that band for nearly 13 years on all of their tours and also on their record albums that they cut during that period of time until 1991, at which time the other members of the band told him that they no longer required his services. Well, recently, there was a reunion of sorts of the Moody Blues, but it took place not in an auditorium in front of thousands of screaming fans, not in a music studio cutting an album, but rather in a courtroom in Los Angeles, because Patrick Mraz was suing the Moody Blues, contending...